We're in 2 Kings chapter 6. I want to read a short text for our passage. It's seven verses, and it, it involves a miracle. Uh, we, we overlook miracles all the time in our lives. This, is, this was given such little significance in Scripture. One wonders uh, why, why it was just a, a, a sort of an afterthought. of If we had witnessed this ourselves in our lifetime, we would go to our grave repeating this story many times over because something that, that happened here was very remarkable and very supernatural. Uh, but as meaningful as this miracle is, and we'll get glimpses of it through our lesson, I want to discuss a deeper, uh, more important theme of this seven-verse text today that we alluded to before, and we'll see again, that uh, it has a lot to do with, uh, uh, has a lot of relevance for our ministry and our lives generally. Uh, so let's look at the passage, 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. It's not big enough for all of us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make us a, pe a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam... The axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed, speaking of that axe head. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore said he, Take it up to thee, and he put out his hand and took it. Wow, I would like to have seen that. Uh, Sounds like one of my tools, by the way, when they had that issue with that. I was coincidentally reading in the book of um, First Kings earlier this week, and I came across a passage. It's the, it's the passage, uh, we looked at it in, uh, on Wednesday night, I think uh, several months ago, dealing with Elijah, and right before his confrontation with the, the prophets of Baal on the top of Mount Carmel, this great historical event and a wonderful victory for God's people and, and for God. And it was a great passage. Right before that, there's some things described that were taking place here. Elijah is traveling, and he comes across a man who is also described as a prophet of God. His name is Obadiah. We, we have probably, I don't think I've ever preached on that passage of Scripture regarding, and I wondered if that was the same Obadiah that carries the name of the Old Testament book, and some people believe it is. Some people say you can't say, and some people say it's probably not. So you, Run, reach your own conclusions, whether it's the same man. But we know his name was Obadiah. And uh, he was, uh, Elijah back then was asking his help on, on an issue. And he said, oh, I don't know, you know, I can't do that. If, boy, if I, if, he was basically saying, go tell King Ahab that I'm in town and I arrange a meeting for us. And he said, I can't do that. If I show my face to Ahab, who is married to a woman named Jezebel, I'll surely be killed because she made a decree that all of the prophets of God, of Jehovah, should be killed. Wipe them all out of the land. Kill every one of them. And he, having a conscience and a, and a commitment to God's work, took, he was able to spare 100 of them. And the details are all given in 1 Kings chapter 18. But he took 100 of them, and he hid them in two different groups in two different caves, and spared of those who knows how many hundreds or thousands of prophets of that time, he spared about a hundred of them. And uh, they, were, they were basically in hiding. Well, the confrontation takes place on Mount Carmel, and the, Jezebel had 450 of her false prophets, and they were slain after the event of that, as it took place in that great chapter. But it seems as if that was the catalyst for developing a training ground. They, all of their prophets had been killed or slain, and they had, to, they had to find men who would replace them to bring the word of God to, to, the, to the land. And so by the time you get to Elisha's life, he is a successor of Elijah. He was also called a servant. And he's also referenced in regard to this school of the prophets. And uh, you, have to give, you have to give him a lot of credit. He when he assumed the mantle of responsibility from Elijah, uh, he knew that this was an important ministry 
with everything else they had going on. And so he, he, be, he continued working in this training school. And this passage we just read is set in the context of chapter number five, where we learned the last couple of weeks about a man by the name of Gehazi, who was also a servant of the Lord and who in all likelihood was also part of that school of the prophets, that training school, that preacher school, that Bible college uh, for, for faithful servants of God. And Gehazi uh, had his own issues. He, he, he was greedy. He was disloyal to his master. He had some obvious character fa uh, faults. And in, in the backdrop of Gehazi, we jump into this chapter here. We learn about this great miracle where an axe head, an iron axe head floats to the surface. But I couldn't help but think that the greater message or lesson in this chapter, as we study the life of Elisha, is this school with all of these unnamed men and their families who were training to serve God. You may remember after the events with Elijah when he had this great victory on the mountain, he ran down and he got all discouraged and he says, I'm the only one left, I'm the only one. He might have, I didn't really until this past week ever put these pieces together. One of the reasons Elijah may have made that statement that I'm the only one living for the Lord now, I'm the only one taking a stand, we often say he was having a pity party, and probably to some degree he was. But one of the reasons why he may, may have been crying out and saying, I'm the only one left wanting to serve the Lord, is because of Jezebel's uh, decree to kill all the prophets. Maybe, the, maybe he felt like they were all dead. Maybe he didn't know about those who had been spared by Obadiah who were hiding in caves. Maybe he felt like everyone, it wasn't so much that I'm the only one trying to do the right thing as much as now all the other prophets have been killed and I'm in a very precarious situation because Jezebel even wants me killed. And she tried, believe me, to have him killed as well. She, she basically sent a death warrant out for Elijah's death. She told him so. They're coming after you. And uh, by the time the sun sets tomorrow, you're going to be a dead man. So we, we have all of this, these, these struggles going on between good and evil. And here's the school that's surviving during a time when it was very unpopular in the land to be a, a spokesman for God. And it not only speaks about our need uh, to train people for Christian ministry, it talks about our individual roles um, as faithful servants of God in a day and age in which Christianity is being frowned upon in every, at every turn media, government, education, social norms, uh, you are being pushed into a smaller and smaller and smaller box all the time. It speaks to our need to stand up and say, I'm going to take my stand for the Lord regardless of the consequences. So I want us to look at this school and we'll inter intersparse some, some details about the great miracle that took place here and, and give you some points about it that may be of help to you. Years ago, my grandfather, when he was alive, I was not able to spend a lot of time with him while growing up, very isolated experiences, but he came to visit us. Once we moved, we, as a family moved to Hawaii, uh, we didn't see a lot of our relatives back in what we call the mainland where we live. We just, is impractical. It's very expensive to fly. But my grandfather made a trip uh, and he flew out to Hawaii to see his daughter, my mom, and all of us. And it was the, uh, a rare setting for me to spend time with him. My mother it, it wisely encouraged individual time with him. She wanted me to spend individual time with him for some reason. I'm very grateful she did. But she suggested I take a day. I was in college then. She said, I take a day and drive my, my grandfather, just m myself and him, around the island and show him some of the sites uh, on the island of Oahu. And I was more than happy to do that for my mom and certainly wanted to spend time with my grandfather. And so um, I, I still, with, uh, I didn't know then, but I know now that that would be the last time that I would see my grandfather alive, is that brief time I had with him. And it meant so much to me that I could just spend some individual time with him before he passed. And um, he, he and I were just talking about life and different things. I remember I didn't script this, but I just I felt impressed to say to him, I was a, actually, I was a senior in high school. And I said to my grandfather, I said, you know, I'm going to be graduating soon. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with my life. What do you think uh, I, should, I should do? 
what, should, what kind of a career should I pursue with my life? I was leaning towards some different things. Um, uh, my dad was in the medical field and I had an interest in that. My mother always worked in social settings. She was a counselor and she worked in different settings where she worked with people. She loved people uh, and people loved her. I loved that idea as well. And I was leaning towards medical technology. Uh, of course, in my heart, I wanted to be a professional basketball player, but that wasn't working out for me very well. So I said to him, what do you think I should do with my life? And he didn't just give me a, a quick answer. He sat while well, we're driving in the car, just he and I, he sat in the car and after several thoughtful seconds, he said, you know, I don't know what it is that God wants you to do with your life. He said, but the world will never have enough preachers or teachers. That's what he said to me. Now at the time I just sort of shrugged it off. Okay, great. I don't want to teach. I don't even like to be a student, much less be a teacher. And preachers, definitely out of the question. You know, <laughs> that's, you know, preachers. Who's going to be a preacher? And little did I know that I would become a preacher and I'd marry a teacher. And, uh, you know, later on in life, that's just the way things played out. But I remember he said that. I think my grandfather had, a, had an understanding that if the Word of God is going to be promoted and um, fulfilled in the hearts and lives of lost sinners, it's going to take a deep commitment on the part of Christians and churches just like ours, training the next generation of Christian servants. Jesus apparently felt that was important too, because one of the very first things Jesus did in his earthly ministry of a three and three and a half year period was he selected, he handpicked 12 men to surround him, to train them. Uh, of course, it was mostly, you know, you know, practical training, showing them things, and, but he also took them aside. There are many things that Jesus probably said to the disciples that are never recorded in the Word of God. But we do know there are times when he would explain parables and, and teach them about things. To, he warned them about things and he prepared them about things. And he was, in effect, doing what he wants all of us to do, to prepare for the future, to realize that no, nobody's sitting here in this auditorium at whatever age you find yourself. None of you, none of us are going to be here forever. And it's incumbent upon us to train the next generation of Christian leaders and serve, to carry on the work of the ministry. And so that's what this School of the Prophets is. And I want to I share some points with you about this school because we hinted at it earlier and we'll look at it a little bit later again. Uh, it was tremendously impactful during that time. And here we are, these many years later, still looking at what, I, what apparently was the brainchild of Elijah when so many had been killed off. He said, we got it. we've got to have someone that's going to carry on the work when we're gone. Elisha grew up and was trained through this very school. He became Elijah's successor. And he was doing the same thing in his own life then. So regarding this school of the prophets, let me say a few things real quickly. Number one, included faithful and devoted followers. In contrast to uh, Gehazi of the last chapter, these unnamed men uh, and were great guys that had a commitment to God and were living during a time when it was literally dangerous to be a prophet of God, to declare yourself to be a prophet of God. You had people in high government positions wanting you to be killed. It had very few benefits and many responsibilities. Uh, there, was, there was no retirement plan, <laughs> no, uh, uh, no uh, uh, pastor's fellowship of other schools in other parts of the country. This was an isolated situation where people were being trained to carry on the work of God. And in fact, we see here a situation where uh, they, apparently they were growing. We'll talk about that in our next point, but they were growing numerically and they needed a place to stay where they could be comfortable. They had families and it just basically got too crowded. And they said, we've got we've to keep this thing going. This is a good thing we have. Other men are joining our ranks and we've got to build something else for people to come and, and uh, stay and be able to train in. Uh, this church has not been uh, unacquainted with limitations with regard to facilities through its history. Uh, when I came here, uh, the two pa faithful pastors that were here before me uh, laid the groundwork for what we were going to ultimately do, and it was difficult going for them. If you can imagine, when I got here, we were renting facilities. Our church didn't have its own property, and they managed, uh, I guess, to that point for about, I'm trying to think of how many years, 79 to 90. 
seven, nine, about 11 years about, or so, about 11 years, two faithful pastors before me uh, faithfully labored here in this area without permanent facilities. They rented all kinds of places. I don't even know all the places they rented. I do know that they rented, <laughs> there was some hospital somewhere that had a bottom floor where the morgue uh, was located. And they had a room on the same floor next to the morgue. Now, I probably wouldn't have picked that location if I were the, if I were the pastor back then. But I just wanted you to know that it showed that there were some desperate circumstances. When I came uh, on staff, we were running a, a, a little A-frame chapel on f- near First and Shields at another church. And we met in the afternoons. And then we went to a Seventh-day Adventist church or school. And I didn't like the fact... I remember going door to door and inviting people to come to church and saying, we meet at the Seventh-day Adventist church. And they would say, oh, are you Seventh-day Adventist? No, no, we're not Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, there was that confusion. But we just did what we had to do to get by. And, um, you know, facilities are important. Pastor Joel has spent a lot of time and effort in the early years of his senior pastorate uh, to improve the facilities next door. I'm, I'm trying to go in there as little as possible because I want the Eureka effect. Like, wow, this is going to be, this is great. And some of you go in there more often, you're watching the progress as it takes place over there. And, and uh, we believe, I'm not minimizing the importance of having facilities. But these guys were looking at something as basic as a, a place to, to house their family members. And they're going to build it out of, out of, out of uh, branches that they would cut down near the Jordan River. And that they would put uh, some kind of a stick framed together and I don't know what they covered it with and 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 it was kind of an exciting time for the ministry back then in Elijah's day they were hiding in caves literally hiding for their lives in Elisha's day things had changed somewhat where they could now uh you know enjoy more uh, uh, uh public accommodations people would know where the school would be located uh, they would be able to go there if they needed some kind of a help, and these people would use this as a, as a head, head base for what they were going to do. So, but they were very devoted men. Most of us would have nothing to do with living under those circumstances in our lives today. Most of you would not leave your, your places of comfort, your homes, wherever you stay, and go move to that kind of a primitive location and, and surround yourself uh, all the time with other people. It's just, it was kind of a, a communal type living situation. We're not accustomed to that. We want our privacy. We want our comfort. And they sacrificed all of that because they were very committed to the ministry. So they, they included faithful and devoted followers. Secondly, they experienced numerical growth. It's exciting to see that one reason they wanted to build something was they couldn't fit where they were meeting. And so God was blessing them, even in, in times of apostasy, And uh, they were determined to do the work of God. And so it's interesting that there doesn't, nothing in the Bible mentions any recruitment effort. There was nobody going around saying, we need more people to be involved in the ministry, to be, we need, we're looking for good, a few good men to be a prophet in this day and age. We don't see any of that being said or done, but people were drawn to this school drawn to this group of people that were committed to doing the work of God, and they were growing numerically. Way back in Samuel's time, Samuel once said this to the people, Fear not, ye have done all this wickedness, yet turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart, and turn ye not aside, for then should ye go after vain things which cannot profit nor deliver, and they are vain. The message for Elisha's day was the same. Hey, we have blown it as a nation. We are experiencing God's judgment. We have a terrible king and queen in our nation. And there's a lot of uh, paganism, a lot of idolatry. But you know what? Now it's time to serve God with all of our hearts. That was their singular message. We need to, we need to go out and do God's work and serve the Lord and, and involve ourselves in serving God rather than ourselves. I don't think there's anything more meaningful, meaningful or rewarding, uh, certainly more important, and uh, maybe at times exciting than serving the Lord with your life. Uh, some of you have jobs and you need your jobs to provide for your families and so forth, but you would admit that those jobs can sometimes become mundane. 
You wonder if there's any long-term spiritual benefit or value with your jobs, but you can all serve the Lord and it has tremendous challenges, but tremendous rewards as well. I spoke with a man in our church this past Wednesday who mentioned that he was going to be retiring. And so I asked him how he felt about that. How do you, how do you, well, how do you feel, feel about that? He says, I'm, I'm, ap- I'm ready to leave. I'm ready to walk away. He said, you know, so here's a man that spent, I don't know how many decades working at this job. He's been with this employer for many years. And he's, he's anxious to finally show up for the last day and say, see you later. I'm, I'm, I'm done with my job here. It's not going to be that way for me. I, 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 whether I'm a volunteer or whatever I'm doing, I'm never going to stop serving the Lord with my life. There's nothing more rewarding that does more for me, that gives me a better perspective of life, and that is going to produce future rewards for me than to serve the Lord. It is an honor to serve the Lord, and we all ought to be serving in some way or another. I tell my children, I've told my children when they were growing up that you probably, this isn't original to me, you probably heard it before, but I said this, as a general way of looking at their lives and what they're doing with their lives, I've often said that they ought to live their lives in such a way that when they leave this world, they've left it better than when they arrived. It just seems like that was, that, that statement made a profound impact upon my life. When we are gone, we should leave this place a better place than before we came. And what really matters is our service to Jesus Christ. That's what will really impact people's lives and carry with us beyond for eternity. And that that challenge before the people, even during the times of apostasy, really resonated. People were like, yeah, I want to come on board. I'm going to leave my farms or whatever I'm doing. I'm going to come and be a part of this school and trained to be a servant of God. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring my family to this setting and we're gonna be part of this wonderful setting where we can use our lives to serve the Lord. And there's some truth to the matter that some of the leaders of these organizations through the centuries have received a lot of credit for what was done through their efforts when in reality, it was the people that God surrounded these leaders with that really made the difference. You know, we think about Elisha. These, the, a lot of these guys, we know the name of Gehazi. Um, I'm not sure we have another single name of anybody else in his school. I'm not sure exactly how many men he had there, but we're not giving their names. But this, this, the work of the ministry that was carried on was carried on by a lot of unnamed people who felt inclined to, to invest their lives in serving the Lord. And, and Elisha became the man of God that he was because of these men that surrounded him that said, we're with you. We're here to do, do the work that God has called you to do. Remember David, uh, David in the Old Testament? Was, David was also a very unpopular man to follow. <laughs> At times, David had Saul on his heels wanting to kill him. Uh, David also had a falling out with his son Absalom, and it was a- absolutely dangerous for him uh, to associate with uh, certain people. When he, he just passed through a, a town one day and got some provisions, and Saul came in afterward and knew that they had assisted David. They didn't know anything, there was any problem with them. And Saul had all the men of the, of the city killed. It was a dangerous thing to associate with the uh, godly people. But I want to read something that said about David's life back in 1 Chronicles. It says, At that time, day by day, there came to David to help him until it was a great host like the host of God. In his difficulty, in his exile, in his problems, he was a fugitive from King Saul. Men said, I want to get behind him and help him. David does, uh, and went through the trouble of listing these mighty men. He gave them responsibilities and a, a, and a line of authority. And thankfully, we have in Second Chronicles some of the men that served under David and some of their wonderful exploits. We rarely preach on that passage of Scripture. It's a great passage to read about. But David, in effect, became the man that he was because of the men that came and served with him. And uh, uh, Pastor Joel knows this, as I do, that, that the success of any church ministry is not really so much about the pastor as it is the people who have come to serve the Lord in that area. And uh, Pastor Joel has done a better job already in the short time he's been the senior pastor of enlisting 
uh, the involvement, that wasn't one of my strong points perhaps, but enlisting the strong, uh, the, the, the benefits, the, the, the talents and abilities of other people to help serve in the ministry. He's already done a lot to incorporate that in the structure of our ministry, and I think t to all of our benefit, uh, to all of our benefit here. So uh, just remember that, you know, um, when, we, when we come along and serve the Lord, it will not only grow uh, numerically, but point number three included spiritual growth as well. Uh, see, the ministry is more than about numbers. In fact, when you gauge the success of a ministry, God is not too impressed with how many, how many, what our attendance figures are. That's not what God is looking at. And when I, I met a man, we were doing some door, door to door. Uh, we were inviting folks to the Easter services a couple weeks ago, and I was by myself that day. I just grabbed some flyers and went out door to door and met a man in the community. Oh, this, this guy wanted to talk. He was, and I graciously tried to get away from him several times because I had a whole stack of flyers to give out. Finally, I had to excuse myself, but he kept me there for about 15 minutes. And he was telling me about his church. He was all excited about his church. And since it, it runs hundreds of people in church and, and so forth, and we began to talk. I said, well, good for you. I never, I didn't say anything to in any way discourage him from staying with his church. I did talk about the importance of preaching the word of God. And then he volunteered some information that he didn't like about his church, but I, I wanted to just get away from him. <laughs> just wanted to get on and keep going. But he said this. He said, you know what? I was walking away. I was walking away in stages. Every time I'd walk and take a few steps, he'd say something else, and I'd stop, and I'd try to walk away. And at this point, I was down near the end of his driveway. I was almost away from him. And he said, you know what, Pastor? He said, I've been a member of this church for 17 years that he's going to. He said, in those 17 years, nobody from my church has ever come to my house as you have today. I felt, I, wasn't, I didn't feel good about that. I felt convicted because I thought, well, there's a lot of people in my church that have attended 17 years that I probably haven't been to their house, I would imagine. That's your job now, Pastor Joel, to figure out who those people are and go out and see them. I, that we probably have some people that I haven't been to their house in 17 years. Um, but I, I, I said to him, this is what I said to him. I said, you know what? That's probably a good thing. I'm trying to make it positive. It's probably a good thing. Because it probably means you haven't had a death in the family or you're not going through marital problems or you, know, you don't have a wayward child or, or some tragedy in your life. That's probably a good thing. You know? I'm glad you're staying active and involved in your church, even though nobody has come. But um, anyway, it's just something to think about in terms of our own ministry. You know? Uh, what the real key is not what the attendance figures may be necessarily, but maybe we should ask not how many people attend your church, but describe the typical member from your church. What does your church do in regard to the missions program? Are you involved in the missions program of your church? Do you support, do you financially support missionaries that go out of your church? Um, what are the families like? How do the families operate within the context of your church ministry there? Are the people in your church honest in business? Do they know their Bibles? Are they impacting their communities and in their places of employment? I was so thrilled last week uh, when we had a full auditorium and I looked out and so many of you invited folks out to Easter services. We didn't make a real big deal of that, but you know, usually we have some kind of a fellowship afterward or whatever, but... Uh, so many of you invited people out to the services last week. It was wonderful to see a full auditorium. Amen? That just blessed my heart to see that. And, uh, you know, there, there's other things, indicators of the spiritual temperature of the, truth, uh, of the church than just the attendance. So uh, I need to go on quickly. Number four, they had a mind to work. Uh, the way they approached the problem shares a lot about the character of the, of the men there. They said, hey, we can't fit in this facility here. We're, we're too crowded. And... Uh, they didn't have, as, as, as I can recall from the text passage, anybody there that said, hey, we'll fund a new facility for you. There are no millionaires in that group saying, hey, we'll, just, we'll, just, we'll build you the state-of-the-art uh, facility here for your new training school. No, here's what they had to do. They said, grab your tools. We're going to go down and everybody cut down a beam. Every man cuts down a tree, clears it, and we're going to build something for us to stay in. And nobody complained. Nobody said, it's against my, uh, 
union rights to, to, to you know, to, to have to go down there and do that. Or, or you know, I, I'm, not, I'm just a preacher. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a tree cutter. You know, it's not, I, I, don't, I didn't come here for hard labor. You know, I left my job of hard labor to come to this. I, I came here so I'd have an easy life. You know, we don't see that. They just grabbed their tools and went down. They were hardworking and resourceful. And um, they didn't wait for someone else to do it. They said, there's, there's a need. It has to be done. And let's just go do it. And I have to appreciate that. I think that's why God used them. These men reminded me of some of our missionaries on the foreign field. I think of Jason Russell, who probably does more in the way of uh, physical construction and labor than most missionaries do. But um, he, he comes over. He doesn't, he doesn't come seeking to raise money for um, uh, his lighting system or his sound system. He comes, he, he want, one year he comes through, he wants to raise money to buy a, a log splitter or a log, what do you call it, a mill. Mill? What do you call it? Yes. Mill. Mill. They want to mill, mill things to build things. And he, he wants a trencher or something. Or he want, he's always buy, get, raising money for this equipment that he can use to, to build for the, for the work of God. And I appreciate that about them. Number five, these, these, these men in this school sought the involvement of their leader. They said, hey, why don't you come with us? Wasn't that insightful? Because <laughs> had they not invited Elisha to come with them on this project, when that axe head you know, floated to the bottom of that pool of water, uh, they wouldn't have witnessed that miracle. And uh, I, they, wa- they, wanted their, they wanted their mentor on board. You know, I, I'm out of time, but I could say uh, so much about that. You should willingly seek the involvement of our pastor in your life. I have to say this, looking back at years of ministry here, I have some people in our church ministry who were faithful, faithful, who went through deep valleys and dark times and big problems, who never once would get on the phone and say, Pastor, can you help us? And, and I, I lose out in that situation, and you lose out in that situation. I hope you know that Pastor Joel loves the people of this church, been here serving here for over 15 years, and he's very approachable. And uh, I especially uh, see him when I want to borrow money. So if anyone need to borrow money, give him a call. He'll be happy to help you out of your financial burdens and problems and probably other things you're going through as well if you just give him a chance. Uh, I used to be able to say he was just a young preacher. He's not young anymore. He's in his 40s now, so he's, he's in a good spot. And finally, they took responsibility for their work. When that, when that axe head floated to the bottom of the river, <laughs> they didn't say, hey, that's, that's not my fault. You know? you know, if you just had good tools here, this wouldn't have happened. They were so poor. Uh, I don't want to use that word. Their resources were so limited that they didn't even have their own tools. They had to borrow somebody else's axe to cut down the trees they were going to clear out and build this building with. And somebody borrowed an axe. And you have to appreciate the fact that when, it, when that axe head fell off, they could have said, hey, that bonehead didn't secure that thing. It's all his fault. Or I don't, I, you know, I'm just over here. I already got my, I already got my, you know, my, my piece, my beam. Don't, don't make me responsible for that. No, they were burdened. If you look at the emotion in their voice, they, they were burdened because they borrowed this tool from someone and there was a sense of responsibility that they wanted to make it right. I try to do that when I borrow things. It's not always the case, but I try to leave things in as good or better condition than when I borrowed it. And sometimes uh, I borrowed a tool from a dear member of our church who's here today, and I won't embarrass him, but boy, I broke that tool and I felt terrible and I took it to a shop and after it stayed there for probably two months or longer, they finally said, we can't get the part to fix it. And, you know, I was just tempted to say, well, you know, what am I going to do? And so I started to look, I I suggested to the individual that I buy a new tool and he adamantly refused to use it as an option. So eventually I got online and I found the part. Here's a problem with that. I don't know how to put the part on. So this is, this is a rare exception for me. I gave the tool back to the individual with the part and said, I'll be happy to come over and help you do it. By the way, I don't have a clue what, what, what I'm doing here. I'll, I'll stand there and cheer you on if you want me to. 
and he graciously said, oh, no, Pastor, you don't have to do that. You don't, you don't have to do that. Don't worry about it. But uh, I always felt bad uh, if I borrow something from somebody and it breaks, that I should make it right. And I, I think these guys had that kind of spirit about them. They were very responsible for this tool. And it gives you an idea in, in the character of these guys and why God used them uh, so wonderfully. So maybe next week I'll tie all this in with how God is using this ministry as a school to train future servants for God and some very encouraging news from our ranks about how this philosophy is still alive and well in ministry today. Father, we